Right. This is chapter 17, part A on the cardiovascular system. So in this section, we're going to focus primarily on uh, heart anatomy. Um, and then in part B, we'll look at the physiology. So the heart is the body's transport system. It consists of two side-by-side -side pumps. So the right side of the heart is going to uh, receive oxygen poor blood from the tissues. Right? So this is denoted in this figure as blue. Right? Um, so then it's going to pump the blood back to the lungs to get rid of carbon dioxide, pick up oxygen uh, via the pulmonary circuit. The left side of the heart is going to receive oxygenated blood from the lungs and pump the blood to the body tissues via the systemic circuit. So this is denoted as um, red, right, is oxygen rich blood. So there's two receiving chambers of the heart. The right atrium right, is going to receive blood returning from the systemic circuit, so that deoxygenated blood. Um, the left atrium is going to receive oxygenated blood from the pulmonary circuit in the lungs. There's also two pumping chambers of the heart, the right ventricle. It's going to pump blood through that pulmonary circuit to the lungs. And the left ventricle is going to pump blood through the systemic circuit to the body and the tissues. So general size, location, orientation of the heart. So it's approximately about one pound in weight, about the size of a fist. It's located in the mediastinum between the second rib and the fifth intercostal space. Um, so two-thirds of the heart actually lie to the left of that mid-sternal line. So it's not directly in the center of the chest. Um, it's anterior to the vertebral column, but posterior to the sternum. So the base of the heart is the posterior surface that's going to face toward the right shoulder. The apex is the point or the tip at the bottom of the heart that's going to point toward the left hip. So the heart has some uh, linings and coverings, just like every other organ we've talked about. Um, so in the heart, the pericardium is the double-walled sac that's going to surround the heart, um, and it's made up of two layers. So you have a superficial um, fibrous pericardium on the outer surface of the heart. So its function is to uh, protect the heart, anchor it to surrounding structures, and also prevent overfilling. Um, deep to that you have the serous pericardium. Okay. Uh, so just like the serous membranes we talked about in Anatomy 1, right, consists of two layers. So you have the parietal layer, that's going to line the internal surface of the cavity or the pericardium. And then the visceral layer of the serous pericardium is going to line the external surface of the heart. So it's going to cling to the actual heart muscle, heart structure. So these two layers will be separated by a fluid-filled pericardial cavity, right, pericardial fluid. So this is to reduce friction between these layers um, so that they don't rub up against one another. Um, so homeostatic imbalance we can have with these uh, linings and coverings of the heart. Uh, could be pericarditis, uh, which would be an inflammation of that pericardium. Um, so this can cause a roughening of the membrane surface and cause a friction rub that can be heard as a creaking sound with a stethoscope. Cardiac tamponade would be where excess fluid leaks into this pericardial space. So this can actually compress the heart's pumping ability. So all this fluid pressing around the heart is going to prevent it from fully um, pumping and contracting like it needs to. So to treat this, we would have to draw this fluid out of the pericardium with a syringe. So there are three layers to the heart wall itself. So we have the epicardium, 
which is the same thing as that visceral layer of the serous pericardium. So it's the outermost covering um, of the heart itself. The myocardium is the uh, muscular layer of the heart wall. So it's going to contain that cardiac muscle cells um, and they're arranged in the spiral type bundle fashion. Um, the endocardium is going to line the internal chambers of the heart. So this would actually have contact with the blood um, and is going to be continuous with the lining of the blood vessels. So like we said, the heart consists of four chambers. So you have two receiving chambers that are the atria and two pumping chambers that are the ventricles. Right? So we have the right atrium and the left atrium. The fossa ovalis is a remnant of the foramen ovale of the fetal heart. So while the baby's in the womb, their lungs aren't operating and breathing oxygen, right? So the blood bypasses the pulmonary circuit um, through this fossa ovalis. Um, the interventricular septum is what's going to separate the two ventricles. Okay, so we said the atria are the receiving chambers. So they're going to receive blood either from the systemic circuit or from the pulmonary circuit. So blood's going to return to the heart to these uh, atria chambers. Okay. Um, so the atria also have what are called auricles. They're just appendages to help increase the atrial volume. So the right atrium again is going to receive deoxygenated blood from the body and the systemic circuit. Okay. Um, so there's three veins that empty into the right atrium to bring blood back to that right atrium. So the superior vena cava is going to return body or return blood from body regions above the diaphragm. Uh, the inferior vena cava is going to return blood from body regions below the diaphragm. Okay. Um, and the coronary sign is not pictured here is going to return blood from the coronary veins um, from the uh, coronary circulation. So that would be the functional blood supply to the heart itself. Okay. So the left atrium we said is going to receive blood, oxygenated blood from the lungs. Right? So there are four pulmonary veins that are going to return that blood from those lungs. So there's two on the left and two on the right. Okay. So shown here also. So they're going to empty into this left atrium right? or then they'll enter the systemic circuit. So the ventricles were our pumping or discharging chambers. So the right ventricle um, is going to be on most of the anterior surface of the heart. The left ventricle is on the posterior inferior surface. Um, so within the ventricles you have what are called papillary muscles. Um, so these small little muscles here. Um, so their function is to anchor the chordae tendinae. Um, that are attached to the heart valve. So the chordae tendinae are the heart strings. So you've heard the expression, you know, tugging on your heart strings. Right? Um, so chordae tendinae are the heart strings. So they're going to um, attach to these heart valves and keep them from collapsing. Okay. Um, so you notice the ventricles have thicker walls than the atria do. Um, because they're the actual pumps of the heart. So this right ventricle is going to pump blood into the pulmonary trunk okay, where it will then go to the lungs to pick up oxygen. The left ventricle is going to pump blood into the aorta which is the largest artery in the body. So from here it's going to go all throughout the systemic circuit all throughout the body. So the heart valves are um, to just ensure a one-way direction of blood flow through the heart. So we don't want any backflow. We want a one-way only um, direction of flow through these heart chambers. So these valves are going to open and close in response to pressure changes as the chambers are filling and emptying. 
Okay, um, so there's two major types of valves. You have the atrioventricular valves, which are located between the atria and the ventricles. So these are the tricuspid and the bicuspid. Um, the semilunar valves are located between the ventricles and the major uh, arteries. So the pulmonary valve right between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk and the aortic valve between the left ventricle and the aorta. Okay, so this is another view showing. Um, so the atrioventricular valves and then the semilunar valves. So like we said, the two atrioventricular valves function to prevent backflow right into the atria when the ventricles contract. Right? So if blood enters into the atria and then travels to the ventricle, we don't want it to go back up into this atrium. Right? We want it to go this way. So this valve will close. Right? So the tricuspid valve um, on the right side of the heart is made up of three cusps. Right, and lines between the right atria and right ventricle. Right, the mitral valve, sometimes called the bicuspid, has two cusps and it's going to lie between the left atria and ventricle. And again, those chordae tendinae or heart strings are going to just anchor those cusps of the valves to those papillary muscles. So the valves um, are held in place and it keeps them from everting or um, kind of turning inside out into the atria. Okay. So this is just showing how the atrioventricular valves work and respond to atrial pressure. So as blood returns to the heart and fills the atria, it's going to press against those valves and eventually it reaches a tipping point where it forces those valves open. So now the blood's going to flow down the valve into the ventricle. Okay. Um, so then finally the atria will contract to force the remainder of the blood into that ventricle. So then later when the ventricle contracts, these uh, cusps and this valve will snap shut. Okay. So we won't have any backflow into our atrium. The semilunar valves are going to prevent backflow uh, from the major arteries back into the ventricles, but they're also going to close and open in response to these pressure changes. So the pulmonary valve is located between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk. The aortic semilunar valve is located between the left ventricle and the aorta. So this is showing how the semilunar valves work. So as the ventricles contract, it's going to increase the pressure and push the blood up. So it opens those valves right, and it leaves the heart. So as the ventricles relax, the blood pressure falls and the blood is going to kind of slide back down the artery. But the cusps of the semilunar valve are going to close and prevent the blood from leaking back down into the ventricle. So a couple of homeostatic imbalances we may see with heart valves. Um, so you could have an incompetent valve. So this is where the blood basically backflows. So the heart repumps the same blood over and over again. So here uh, we have kind of a weak or faulty valve. So when the ventricle contracts, right, the blood is going to go back up into the atria instead of one direction out of the pulmonary trunk. Uh, in valvular stenosis, it's a stiffening of the valve, so it's going to constrict them from opening. So the heart's going to have to exert more force of contraction to um, open up those valves. Um, so a defective valve can be replaced with either a mechanical, um, an animal, or a cadaver valve. Okay, so some animal valves we um, typically see are things like pig or um, cow. 
Okay, so tracing the pathway of blood flow through the heart. So we'll start with the systemic circuit on the right side. Okay, so blood returns to the heart through the superior and inferior vena cava in the coronary sinus. Okay, enters into the right atrium. Okay, um, so then from there, the blood's going to pass through the tricuspid valve and enter into the right ventricle. So from the right ventricle, it passes through the pulmonary semilunar valve here, where it enters the pulmonary trunk. So from there, it's going to diverge off to the pulmonary arteries, one going to the left, one going to the right, um, to the lungs, where it picks up oxygen and dumps carbon dioxide. So then after it picks up oxygen in the lungs, it's going to return toward the heart. So now looking at the left side of the heart, the systemic circuit, so the blood that we just picked up oxygen uh, in the lungs is going to return to the heart through four pulmonary veins, right? So two on the left and two on the right. Um, so from there, it's going to enter the left atrium right, and pass through the mitral valve into the left ventricle. From the left ventricle, it's going to pass through the aortic semilunar valve and then out through the aorta. Right. So then from there, it's going to travel the systemic circuit all throughout the body and the tissues, delivering oxygen, picking up carbon dioxide. Um, so this is where we get that transition from red oxygenated to blue deoxygenated. So then after the blood leaves the tissues, um, it's going to head back toward the heart. Okay, so now we put everything together, right? So from leaving the tissues, the systemic circuit, back to the heart, the superior and inferior vena cava into the right atrium. So then we would continue the cycle all over again, starting with the pulmonary circuit. So equal volumes of blood are generally pumped to both pulmonary and systemic circuits, even though they are different. So the pulmonary circuit is a short, low pressure circulation. So it only has to travel from the heart to the lungs and back to the heart. So not very far at all. Um, whereas the systemic circuit is a long distance, high um, pressure circulation. So we have to get the blood to flow all the way from the heart to the very tips of your toes and back again. So the anatomy of the ventricles reflects these differences. So as you can see, the left ventricle for the systemic circuit is three times as thick as the ventricular wall on the right. So this allows it to pump with greater uh, pressure and force so that we have enough pressure behind the blood leaving the heart to make it all the way through the systemic circuit. So coronary circulation is the blood supply to the heart muscle itself. So this is the shortest circulation in the body because it never leaves the heart. Okay. Um, so the coronary arteries, both left and right coronary arteries, um, are going to supply this arterial blood to the heart muscle cells. Okay. Um, so the heart receives actually about 1 20th of our body's uh, blood supply. So the left coronary artery is going to supply our interventricular septum, the anterior ventricular walls, um, left atrium, and the posterior of the left ventricle. Right. So the two branches of the left coronary artery are the circumflex artery and the anterior interventricular artery. Right. So you see where it just kind of diverges and splits off into these two. So the interventricular is going to kind of travel along that interventricular septum. The circumflex is going to kind of wrap around, so think like circle, circumference, so it's going to wrap around the side um, toward the back of the heart. Your right coronary artery is going to supply uh, basically the right side of the heart, the right ventricle, the right atrium. Um, so it also has two main branches, so the right marginal artery and the posterior interventricular artery. So it's going to wrap around to the back of the heart um, and diverge there.
coronary veins are going to um, collect the blood from the capillary beds where then they uh, empty into the coronary sinus, into that right atrium. Right? So we said the right atrium receives blood from the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, and this coronary sinus. So this coronary circulation is beneficial because it means the heart is not going to use any of the blood that it's actively pumping to the rest of the body. So it has its own blood supply. So, so homeostatic imbalances with um, heart, heart muscle could be uh, angina pectoris, which is just uh, chest pain caused by kind of deficiency in blood flow to the myocardium or the heart muscle. So as a result, the cells are a little weakened um, and they start to send off those pain signals. Um, so if it progresses from there, then we would have a myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack. So this is caused by kind of a prolonged coronary blockage. Um, so the areas of cell death are going to be repaired with non-contractile scar tissue. So these heart muscle cells are constantly working, right? So they need a constant supply of nutrients and oxygen and blood. So if we have a prolonged blockage where some of the cells don't have access to that oxygen and nutrients, um, those cells start to die. Um, and because cardiac muscle does not regenerate, those dead cells are going to be replaced with scar tissue. So the scar tissue doesn't have the same contractile um, components as the muscle cells. So the scar tissue is not going to be able to contract. Um, so that's going to affect the overall efficiency and function of the heart itself. So some microscopic anatomy of the cardiac muscle fibers. Um, so cardiac muscle cells are similar to skeletal muscle with a few differences. So um, they are still striated, but they're much shorter and branched um, and interconnected. Um, so they have generally one central nucleus, um, sometimes two nuclei, um, but they have many, many mitochondria. So numerous large mitochondria account for roughly 35% of the cell volume. Um, so this is for resistance to fatigue because we do not want our heart muscle cells to get fatigued and stop contracting because then your heart would stop beating. Okay. Um, they also have intercalated discs which are these connecting junctions between the cardiac cells. It's going to um, connect these cardiac cells together. Um, so these intercalated discs contain desmosomes, which are going to physically hold the cells together, help prevent them from separating during contractions. Um, so remember from anatomy one, we described these kind of like the Velcro cellular attachments. Um, the gap junctions are an electrical or chemical connection. So these allow the ions and action potentials to pass from cell to cell very rapidly. So this allows the heart to behave as what's called a functional syncytium or a single coordinated unit. So we want all of our heart muscle cells to um, be coordinated and contract kind of in unison um, instead of independently. So this is just showing another example of cardiac microscopic anatomy. So uh, we have these many, many mitochondria. Right. Um, it still has the, uh, the microfilaments, right? so the actin and mice and that sliding filament model that we had with skeletal muscle with the I bands and the A bands and the sarco, uh, sarcolemma. Okay. Um, so some similarities with skeletal muscle. So it's still going to be preceded by depolarization um, and action potential. So all of that that we talked about last semester is still going to apply here where action potential, kind of an electrical impulse is going to be the trigger for muscle contraction. So that depolarization or that charge is going to travel down the T-tubules causing the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium, okay, which then triggers our excitation contraction coupling. So remember when we release calcium, it's then going to bind to that troponin causing the filament to slide. So the actin um, is able to uh, bind to the uh, tropomyosin or myosin, sorry.
Yeah, so this is showing um, kind of excitation contraction coupling. So this was the example from the muscle um, chapter, skeletal muscle. Um, but from here, it's going to be essentially the same with cardiac muscle. So we have an action potential depolarization that travels down our T-tubules. So this action potential causes these calcium channels to open and release calcium ions into the sarcoplasma. Um, so then from there, the calcium ions bind to that troponin. So remember that troponin was blocking those binding sites on the actin. So calcium binds to those and changes their shape. So now those binding sites are exposed. So now myosin can form cross bridges with the actin, and we have our, um, our power stroke and our contraction. So once the calcium has been removed um, or dissipated, the, the action potential is ended, then the uh, tropomyosin goes back to blocking those binding sites and we restore our resting potential. So a few differences now between cardiac and skeletal muscle. So cardiac muscle cells are self-excitable. So skeletal muscle wasn't able to um, kind of excite itself, so it was voluntarily controlled. Right? So cardiac muscle, since it's involuntary, those cells are able to stimulate themselves, right? which is a good thing because if you had to voluntarily, consciously you know, contract your heart muscles all day long, you wouldn't get anything else done. Right? So there's two types of uh, myocytes in cardiac muscle. So some are contractile cells responsible for the contraction, so your typical muscle cell. Um, but then there are some specialized cells called pacemaker cells. So these are non-contractile, um, but they are what's going to provide our depolarization. So they initiate depolarization of the entire heart. So because it's kind of self-contained within the heart, it doesn't rely on a nervous system stimulation right, in contrast to the skeletal muscle. Um, also, heart muscle contracts as a unit, so that functional syncytium. Um, so this is to ensure effective pumping action, right? um, whereas our skeletal muscles can contract independently. Okay, so just another table showing the key differences between your skeletal and cardiac muscle. Right, so structure-wise, skeletal muscle was long, striated, cells, um, whereas cardiac muscle is striated, but they're much shorter and branched. A cardiac muscle contains gap junctions, so that way we can uh, rapidly pass those action potentials and those ions from cell to cell. Uh, and this allows cardiac muscle to contract as a unit, a functional syncytium. Okay. Skeletal muscle fibers contract individually. Okay. Um, so calcium is still going to bind to troponin in both cases. Uh, but cardiac muscle cells have their own pacemaker cells. And also supply of ATP. So with cardiac muscle, it's only going to be aerobic. So that's why they have so many mitochondria. So we don't run out of ATP and energy in our cardiac muscle cells. So it's possible for skeletal muscle to tap into anaerobic metabolism once we've kind of used up all of our energy. Um, and it's possible for uh, skeletal muscle to become fatigued right, and stop functioning. Um, but if our cardiac muscle were to become fatigued and our heart stopped beating, then we would die. So we don't want that to happen. So we have lots of mitochondria to ensure an uh, aerobic respiration.